Hello everyone, thanks for tuning in uh, our webinar today. So my name is Jia Xuan, I'm from the Outreach and Education Unit of the Li Kong Chen Natural History Museum. And today we have invited Dr. Francis Xiao, who has kindly taken time out of his very busy schedule to speak to us about his two fields of lifelong passions and interests. So one of it is uh, human medicine and the other one is FESMITS or the study of FESMITS, which is a term used to describe uh, or refer to stick insects and leaf insects. So for those meeting Dr. Xiao for the first time today, uh, he's a very well-known colorectal surgeon in private practice in Singapore. But despite his numerous achievements in the world of surgery, right, he still manages to find time to pursue his other love, which is stick insects and leaf insects. Okay, so over the years, Dr. Xiao has amassed a wealth of knowledge on these insects. And to date, he has actually published a number of books on these insects. And he's also an honorary research affiliate with us at the museum. So without further ado, it's with great pleasure that I welcome Dr. Xiao to speak to us. So if you have any questions for Dr. Xiao along the way, uh, feel free to type it in the chat box and he will address mm. them towards the end of this session. So please also note that uh, the session will be recorded and the recorded version of this webinar will be available in due time on our museum's website. So Dr. Sam, you may share your um, slides now. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jashua, for the introduction. Now, um, I'm just going to share my screen. Give me a second. Now, um, when the museum very kindly asked me to give a talk on stick insects, I wondered actually whether people are really interested, you know, um, and in insects itself. And I, and I felt that many people will be. But more importantly, I wanted to really motivate people not just to look at insects, but to really see what interests them in nature and to go out there and do something about it. All of us are very busy uh, as professionals and as other uh, in other vocations or as students. And often we feel that we have not much um, time to do other things outside of our interest. So I want to just say here that our work, the work we do to get a living, to support ourselves and our family of the studies that we are doing, uh, these things are very important to us, of course. In, and I just want to share uh, myself um, just a little bit uh, more. Uh, I was the head of uh, the Department of Corrective Surgery in Singapore General Hospital. I was head of Surgical Oncology, National Cancer Center, and I, I was and still am on the editorial boards of many international journals and chairman of several um, corrective societies and other societies now in the, and in the past. And in fact, uh, this work that I did uh, gave, gave, uh, gave me a lot of accolades. I was given the awarded the Excellence of Singapore Medal for my international contributions in corrective surgery in the year 2000. So, you know, work is very important. Work allows us uh, the freedom, the, not just um, uh, the, the financial freedom, as, as well as other freedom to do things uh, that we um, want to do. Family, of course, we mustn't neglect families. Our families are very important. Uh, they are really our support, both in pursuing our work as well as in our interests. And of course, friends are very important. Our friends who support in times of need, friends who give us you know, encouragement uh, when we need uh, to do what we need to do. And friends often are able to tell us what we are doing wrong or what we are doing right. Of course, you know, serving uh, the community we live in is also very important. Uh, myself, I try and get involved in as many things as possible. Um, I, 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 I'm a board member of the church I go to, and I've, I was a founding chairman of Guide Dogs of the Blind Association here in Singapore. I feel that we should give something to society, and I also was one time the chairman of City College, which is a charity aimed at helping uh, you know, reject from normal school. But, you know, all these things that we do um, may not be really... Um, you know, enough uh, because we also uh, don't just live to work, you know, and we need to live with meaning to our life. A lot of us have no time for living because we live for work, you know, we, we go to work in the morning, we work the whole day, we come back, we just eat and sleep and next morning it's work again. 
So many of us just live in order to work and few actually work in order to live. And when I say live, I mean live life to its fullest. You know, we live on the world. Do we know the part of the world we live in? Do we know the other lives, the other lives besides human lives that live around us? So life is really more than just slogging, you know, to get by each day. Of course, I, we know that there are many people who don't have time to do that. But those of us here in Singapore, uh, where we have a more decent sort of um, environment, and many of us who are uh, able to get through life without, without uh, uh, resorting to desperate means, uh, we need to really find more meaning to life rather than just slogging uh, to a, a, an exams or slogging uh, through our work each day. You know, we all have talents and talents not just to do work, you know, not just to do the mundane things in life, but to do something, to shout about something, to sing about something, to find that higher you know, sphere in which uh, we go through life. So although we may be down in the mud, you know, although we may be uh, just splashing around water, but we can go above that to a high level. So what really do we want to do besides working and slogging and you know, doing the mundane things in life? And, and this is what I want to say today. We do, should not put off to tomorrow what we can do today. Because really, the important thing we need to know is we may not have the chance to do tomorrow what we should have done today. And that always motivates me to try and do things today and not wait for tomorrow. And really, you know, those of us who say, look, I got no time really. No time means really no interest. You know, if, if, if our friends, so-called, say, hey, look, let's go out tonight or let's do this tonight. We say, oh, sorry, you know, I really got no time. What it really means is not we got no time, but that we are not interested in them or in the activity that they are suggesting. So we really need to think about our priorities in life. Time allocated is time prioritized. So we need to give time to what we think uh, are the important things, which gives meaning to our life, which gives us um, you know, a more um, enlightened approach to how we want to get meaning in our own lives. All of us actually have the same amount of time daily, but what makes some people do more is, is how they prioritize their time, not because they have more time than the rest of us. In fact, I, I, have, I have found in my leadership role in the hospital uh, that those people who do a lot actually have more time to do more. Those that say they don't have time often are those that don't do anything at all. So the world that we live in is really too interesting for us to be just narrow-mindedly looking at just one aspect, be it our studies or be it our work. You know, the world around us, the natural world around us is too full of wonders which are yet to be fully understood. And a lot of us just cruise through. As the Chinese say, you know, we're sitting on our horse looking at flowers. Uh, we don't really appreciate the things that are around us. But when we look in greater detail, we may be surprised and we may be, you know, um, totally, uh, as, as the Buddhists say, you know, enlightened. Each of us have only one life. So it's not about having time, really. It's about making time for things that matters. We live on the earth. We must understand. We must look after her. So I, I just want to give you know, uh, a few pictures just to show you know, it's not just insects that are around the world, although that's my interest. But as we go out and look at natural, we, we come across various things. This is a Bornean bearded pig. Orangutan's quite fierce looking. We found her in a forest sitting down on a tree. So I went behind her and gave her some rabbit ears and, and my friend took a picture of it. You know, we see things that we don't normally see here in the concrete jungles of Singapore. Things, we begin to understand nature a bit more. We know how to interact with nature. We know how to handle nature. Things that people regard as venomous, poisonous. Uh, when we understand, we appreciate, we appreciate, we are able to love. So the world is full of wonders. And I just want to bring you through about why from being a successful surgeon 
uh, why I became so involved in the natural world, especially in stick insects. Well, I'll tell you a story, a short story. Um, when my kids were very young, much younger than this, actually, uh, these were my kids when they were just coming to teens or before they were teens. And I, I, I wanted to get them involved with nature. And I brought them bird watching and then they said, oh, those birds are so far away. And everybody's looking, peering through the binoculars. So they started catching um, some insects by the wayside. And Jackie got scolded by the bird watchers. They said, leave the insects alone. Uh, you know, but my son said, you know, it's more interesting. We can handle them, we can touch them, we can feel them, we can understand them. And so I started to bring them up with me uh, on my trips, uh, looking at insects, and they got very um, enthusiastic. And my children, they often come up with me, and now they are interested in nature in their own rights. I just want to show you some of the interesting things about, about uh, these stick insects, and, 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 and then I'll tell you uh, what we have done with them uh, over the years. Here we see, look, um, three sort of very different looking insects. And some of these insects uh, in the past, as I started studying, as I started learning about them, I found out that you know, many of the insects were described in two or three different uh, genera, uh, some of them even in different genera. Of course, some as different species. Here we see one single species, but you see the three different colors. Uh, the, the, the large yellow one is a female adult. The blue one with the yellow spot on the head, that's a male. And you see the, um, the sort of nymph on the top there with a different coloration altogether. So these insects can be very interesting uh, in terms of coloration, these stick insects. Here you see one, a brown one with lots of spines on its, on its body and head, uh, eating a, actually one of the uh, sort of banana leaf family uh, leaves. And here's another one. Uh, this insect, a very spiny one, one of a large insect actually found from Malaysia, it used to be present in Singapore, it's now extinct. And they do like a drink once in a while. And uh, very interesting, this insect is very popular in insect parks around the world. Uh, it's a species we call Hathroptrix dilatata. They themselves are also, you know, they are, they are in a way defenseless, ex except for some of them with spines. And they are actually food for a lot of animals as well. Like here, slow loris eating a stick insect here in the jungle in Singapore. And here's a very common species we see in Singapore, a small one, uh, but interesting in itself. My elder son, when he was very young and interviewed by the Straight Times, said this was a, his favorite stick insect. You see the crown of the head, uh, quite spectacular, although small. And here you see another species. Uh, you see the male is so brightly colored. Uh, with uh, red front legs, green body, a female more like a, you know, a, a rotten piece of twig at the bottom. Uh, I hope you all can see that. Uh, here we see what we call a leaf insect. This again is a species that is found here in Singapore. Um, it, the male is less leaf-like, but nevertheless still you know, yellowish. Uh, she's in the process of uh, mating. The female, very leaf-like. You see the central veins, the side veins. Uh, even the legs look as if they've been chewed a little bit by other insects. And so that's how they camouflage uh, themselves. Uh, here we see a, a, a species um, from, uh, from, from uh, Borneo, actually. Um, quite spectacular. You see the orange eyes. Um, the, the female, the one at the bottom, again, meeting with a male. The female hasn't got wings. You see the wings in the male, but really a quite spectacular uh, species. You look at the antenna of the female, especially the one bigger at the bottom. You see the first few antonomes are sort of globular and, and really quite distinguished species from other species in the genera. Some of these smaller ones, but still very interesting. This is what we call a touch me not uh, in stick insect. Its name is Epidarius noligmi tangeri, which means don't touch me. The, the spines are very sharp and easily pierces um, skin if you catch hold of it. And just a word, you know, often we see right at the lower end, we see a chicken egg, it's round. That's how our idea of eggs are. But when you look at stick insects, eggs, they come in all sorts of various. Here's the crocodile egg or comparison yeah but you see this thing say some of them are totally flat this one is flat like a couple of uh, sheets of paper 
Uh, you see this egg here is pierced into a leaf, and here you see eggs. Another species very sculptured, and here you see some uh, eggs which have a feathery attachment on the outside. And you see here some other sting insect eggs which are glued to leaf, and other eggs which look more like you know seeds. Some round, some long, some hairy. So very interesting, really. And um, you know this sort of egg uh, morphology has given rise to a whole new um, way of classifying insects. We call it uh, utoxonomy, which means classification based on egg shapes. And it's quite helpful to us when we deal with stick insects, as some of them look quite familiar, uh, similar, and we have to distinguish them sometimes by morphology, sometimes by the way uh, they mate, sometimes by the, by the genitalia, by the lack of wings, by the shape of the body and so forth, and by the eggs as well. Just to show you some, you know, uh, different characters. Very interesting. This uh, stick insect, which is found here in Singapore, quite a large one. Uh, it can be, you know, up to about twenty centimeters, twenty-five centimeters long. This is a female. You see those giraffe-like uh, horns on the head. Extremely attractive, and with a sort of a turban on the, on the back of the head. This is a species that I actually named from Ulu National Park. In fact, I wanted to call it um, with affection for my Punjabi friends, you know, <laughs> call this a turban stick insect. And here is one you see um, with lots of spots, acne-like on the head, very attractive, but only probably to its mother and to me. And here you see some of these insects it looks very dull and dark, but you look at the eyes, eyes look like, you know, sort of golden marble, a really interesting species. A species of this uh, genus is actually found in Singapore, very bulky and large, uh, which um, I have named actually, found here in the swamp forest in Singapore. And these are not uh, butterflies. Uh, are not flowers, these are actually a stick insect with its wings spread out in display. And this species, unfortunately, is not found in Singapore. It is found in Peninsula Malaysia, as well as in Sumatra uh, and in um, Borneo. This is a species of a leaf insect. Uh, you can see how leaf-like it is. Um, I just want to show you, and it I often, uh, these insects they don't have they don't change color immediately but they can as they grow they can adapt the color of the food plants in which they live this is the same uh, stick insect saw earlier but it's become red or reddish because it feeds on eugenia um, and uh, the eugenia the top leaves are, are reddish and you see where this insect feeds on the leaf it adapts the color so that it can hide more effectively and not all stick insects, you know, are dull and stick-like. You see this one uh, from Borneo again. You see how colorful it is with red eyes, red linings of the head, and gray, and yellow, and pink, uh, as well as green wings. Here's a species that's very common here, in, uh, commonly red in Singapore, not found a while in Singapore. Uh, but this species uh, was reared when I was a young kid. We kept this as well, and oh, its okay. droppings, its droppings was um, kept um, and collected and made as um, in the Chinese medicine for people with a whole, whole host of, of, of ailments. But you see how colorful it is, bright red underwings and uh, various green and yellow pattern to the body. Here's one which is interesting I just want to show you uh, when it's threatened it um, spreads its wings uh, and you see the end of the abdomen. Now, what does that remind you of? Really, it makes itself look like a cobra, right? With the spread out um, you know, neck and the tongue and the jaws. And it actually, I don't have a video here, but if you look at the live insect, it really moves its end of the abdomen to and fro, much like a cobra would. We don't know how the insect uh, has learned this, but uh, certainly it's quite effective uh, mimic for birds and so forth that want to eat it or attack it. And this insect is quite large. It's about uh, 
um, 25, 30 centimeters big. So really it's quite effective in mimicking a, a small cobra. And you know, these insects are interesting in other ways. Um, and we were looking at the, at the genetics of this insect. You see here, uh, this, this insect has, this insect has uh, lost its left leg. And uh, as it grows older, it's able to replace that with a new leg. Now this new leg has, uh, has just grown and the insect grows, as you know, insects grows with metamorphosis. So every time it sheds its skin, it's able to grow the leg longer. This is just after the first molt, so the leg is still curled up. With the next molt, you grow longer and uncurl a bit more. And with the next molt, you will uncurl even more and become straighter. The new leg, of course, will not be as long or as good as the old leg, but you function normally, uh, albeit a little bit shorter. But here you see one that has um, grown a short leg. Uh, it's growing straighter now and longer. And if it's a nymph, it will still keep growing its leg until it reaches adulthood. After adulthood, because they don't move anymore, uh, they can't grow any more legs if they drop them. So, uh, a very interesting, this insect. So recently, it has been found that uh, Calvicia, for example, like this, um, it's a very colorful stick insect. And some of the, of this, uh, of its babies can actually adopt different coloration. There's a species in Thailand we know now because it's been reared in captivity where the mother has bright red wings, almost like this insect, but the, the wings are red. Um, but where her baby, some of the wings are totally white and some of them are totally red. So a lot of these things still await further study to see why they are so and why the colors are so dramatic. Whereas other stick insects, we know they survive by camouflaging themselves. So they are very cryptic and difficult to find, but others are just so bright and stand out in their surroundings. And some of them, hide in other ways. The male, of course, hide looking at a stick. But you see this female here, she's so mossy. And obviously she hides among moss in, in, on tree trunks and so forth. And if it lies flat, you can't see them. And I'm sure some of you may not be able to see the female, which is just here, and the male, which is on top. And here's another one. This is a big species. You see how foliaceous it is. And in fact, its name is Phobeticus uh, foliaceus. Uh, and you can see the, all the epaulets here on the legs as well as the body. Uh, how, you know how leaf-like it is when it hangs there. If you are not uh, very careful or not very um, attentive, you will miss this as just another twig or as, as, as another uh, lichen uh, growing on, 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 on branches. And like this, dramatic coloration bright red head, purple and red front legs, bright purple uh, four wings, yellow hind wings, and you see the bodies. And many of the stick insects are really uh, dramatic. So just looking at insects, just looking at their form, just looking at how they live, um, it's interesting, but we can, we can do more. The, the reason is a lot of people are afraid I've given some public lectures here in Singapore. Children, of course, uh, before they are told anything uh, to the contrary, they like to touch, they like to see, they like to hold. Um, but adults say, keep away, it's dangerous. Keep away, it's poisonous. Keep away, it's venomous, you know, or it bites you. And here, I was in Timor, and these are Timorese from Central Timor. And when I went there, I found out that they are totally afraid of this thing called a stick insect. They have been folklore passed down apparently from their first king that if they touch, ever touch one of these green large stick insects, they will die immediately within a few seconds. And when I went there, they, every single stick insect like this, they saw they killed immediately because they say it's as venomous as any snake they have on the island. And you know, they have uh, pit vipers and king cobras and all in Timor. So when I went there, I told, look, they are not at all dangerous uh, to anybody. And they all came around and they all uh, did not want, you know, to handle it until they were educated. So in our quest, especially, uh, just not for our interest or just to take photographs, uh, we, we need also to get more knowledge ourselves and to spread the knowledge around to other people, whether it's just stick insects or, you know, other animals that are around in our forests. 
uh, each of our individual countries. So here you see, uh, after some persuasion and after they seen me handling and I did not fall dead after five seconds, uh, they started handling it and they all wanted the photograph. And I'm sure that villagers there are now happily living in harmony with this particular species. And this species, uh, this particular insect I found in, in uh, the two guys' uh, garden. Uh, they are father and son and in their garden, they had a pair of this insect and they were about to kill it when I arrived there that morning. Yeah, so all this may seem very foreign and very difficult, you know, but the journey of a thousand miles, as we say, starts with the first step. A lot of us here and a lot of people in, uh, in our environment, you know, our, our friends, our family, our relatives, they fear animals, insects, you know, um, snakes, etc., because they don't understand them. Incomprehension causes you know, aversion, antipathy. But with knowledge, when we have knowledge, it piques our interest. And when we have interest, you know, then we get involved. And when we get involved, the involvement will bear fruit. I want to share with you how this uh, comes about. So we don't want just to go through life slogging and just working meaninglessly. And, and because I felt a need to sort of educate people when I first started, I just did some very um, uh, sort of low level, uh, just guidebooks on the insects that can be found here. Uh, these are some of the books I initially wrote in 19, I think it was 1990, uh, 1985, there, thereabouts. Uh, then we went on uh, over the years to be more involved, to study these animals. And over the last um, six years, I've written seven books, plus the ones I wrote about 20, 25 years ago. I've now done 10 books on, on stick insects. These are some of the later, later books, uh, which illustrate the full range of stick insect to be found in Borneo, in Sumatra, in Peninsular Malaysia, uh, and in Singapore. So in fact, naming things is so important and accurately naming things is primary. For those of you, you know, who, who, who are religious, here is a, a quote. In fact, it's one of the first things uh, that uh, the Christian God told, told Adam. He, if you read this, so out of ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. Taxonomy is actually a calling from God. And we don't know the name of the insects like here. Most of us will say, oh, this is just very dirty crocodiles. But they are not. They are not house crocodiles. They have their own name, right? You see here, this is one species. In fact, this photograph was photographed in Singapore. This cockroach is a loving mother with its own name. You see how carefully it looks after its babies. They all crawl under her. And they live under her. She nourishes them, she looks after them until they are ready to leave the home. And here's another crocodile also found in Singapore. This is a peel crocodile. She builds a nest out of a roll-up leaf and her babies live in there under her as well. And she, 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 she sort of um, puts herself, she puts herself right at the, at the edge there so that nothing can go in. It's over her dead body if you want to get to her babies. So, you know, these things have their name and we, uh, and that's how I got involved in taxonomy because we just don't want to call them that crocodile, you know, or that sick insect. Uh, and this is a story. And when we look deep into nature, as Einstein said, then we will understand everything better. So in the last, you know, 30, 30 years or so of studying these insects, I've written now 10 books. I've described 34 new genera of stick insects. I have, this, I have described 250 new species of stick insect. And of course, they have clarified uh, and changed the, the names and nomenclature of more than 280 known species. And this is my second, uh, I'm proud to say, uh, Medal of Excellence. I was awarded the J.O. Westwood Medal of Excellence in Insect Taxonomy in 2018 by the Royal Entomological Society as well as the Marsh Christian Trust. And here you see me with three other co-authors, two of them from Germany and one from England, who are also experts in stick insects. I want to share with you something since we are here in Singapore uh, about what you have done. This is a book I wrote in 2017, uh, Taxonomic Guide to Stick Insects of Singapore. And these are the various uh, stick insects from Singapore 
uh, that were described. New genera, imagine in Singapore, such a small place, two new uh, genera of stick insects, Lobo necroskia, which we described in 1999, and Singapore roidia. We'll go through some of this in a while, 2016. And you see here various species that were described from Singapore. I want to show you some of them and how we name them and, and why we name them such. Uh, this is Singapore roidia, a new genus named after Singapore. Now, this is not a new species. This species was described by J.O. Westwood, who is a British entomologist working the, at the British Museum of Natural History. In 1859, he named a species from Singapore. This was, in fact, found from Bukit Timah Hill, calling it Necroskia uh, ninophthalamus. Now, this was subsequently transferred to another genus, Cephaloidea by Rottenbacher, and it's been in this genus since 1908. But when I started looking at the Singapore stick insects and compared them with all the other species in the genus Cephaloidea, it didn't add up. The features of this insect were not those of Cephaloidea, and there were no other uh, genus that it, it uh, could put it in, into because of various factors, which I won't go into today. Uh, and so I erected a new genus called Singapore Roidea because this species was found in Singapore. It's quite common here in Singapore. Uh, it's also found in, in Johor, but you know, it was first described here. So I decided that we should honor our country where it's found in, and named it after Singapore, calling it Singapore Roidea. Now, Another new species, I have not, I have, I just showed, shown you the, the photograph of the insect, but here I show the man, Tommy Ko, uh, a new species which we found, uh, again described in 2017 in that book, A Textmark Guide to Stick Inside of Singapore. Uh, Tommy, uh, Professor Tommy, uh, he had numerous accolades and awards, including Champion of the Earth. He's also a patron of Lee Kong Chen Natural History Museum, our host tonight. He is the patron of guide, guide, a Nature Society, as well as Guide Dogs Association of Blind, of which I, as I said, was the founding chairman. And very helpful indeed to us who are interested in nature. And therefore, I dedicated new species to him. I named it after Professor Tommy Koi. It's Planus Ocibia, Tommy Koi, and a stick insect, uh, which so far has been found only in Singapore, as well as in a very small part in Tapa Hills, recently by me. Now, some of you may know this man, Professor Dennis Murphy. He was the first sort of local um, zoologist, entomologist. Uh, Professor Murphy's field of specialty was entomology, but he was really uh, a polymath with wide ranging interests. So when I first started looking at insects in 1990, I, I spoke to him many times and he got me really interested. He helped me with some rare manuscripts to get me started because as you know, uh, these books, uh, on sick insects are almost non-existent. In fact, non-existent, except for a few old books from the 1900s. And he told me, you know, nobody's studying them. Just go out and do what you can and find them and describe them, which is what I did. So when I found a, a new species here in Singapore, another species, I named it after him, Carabistus murphyi, after Professor Murphy. And of course, a lot of you know about this leaf insect which I named after uh, Chris Ang, uh, my, my good friend. Chris, of course, knew about interest in stick and leaf insects. And he had often seen this particular leaf insect in the mangrove forest in Singapore. I myself had not seen any because I seldom go to mangrove at that time um, because most of my insects are in the forest. So when he came across one, uh, one day he called me and we got a specimen. And that specimen is described in this book, a stick, the stick insects of Singapore. So naming after people who helped, naming after Singapore where the insect was found, naming it after um, prominent people and also people who find things or who are helpful in, in discovery. Here is another uh, insect called um, Asilis, yeah, uh, Rabie. Uh, I named it after this Malaysian entomologist, uh, Ms. Rabiha Ismail. She was very helpful to me in my study of stick insects in Peninsula, Malaysia. And although this insect is found in Pennsylvania, Malaysia, it is also found very commonly here in Singapore. And she herself has published many papers on the diversity of stick insects in Peninsula, Malaysia. Uh, and this is, uh, Siwi is a forensic accountant and very busy every day, but she came for a few forest trips many years ago and we found this species. And so I named one of the insects after her called uh, this Chlorobistus Siwiye. 
Now, we also uh, told you we name um, uh, this other new um, genus as well as new species. Uh, here you see the, this is the only species in this uh, genera to date. And this, the genus is named after the dilated front lobes of the female, you can, you can see here. And the specific name subflavor, meaning you know, yellow, uh, is named after the yellowish uh, male. So, so you know, there are various ways of naming uh, th things that we find. And here's another species that are named after Singapore called Asilis singapura. Okay, this large Asilis species, very, in, very nice, interesting, was named after Singapore because I first discovered it in Singapore. Subsequently, we found them also in lowland forests in Johor and in Pahang. Um, now, of course, we don't uh, just simply give names. Uh, there are rules for naming animals according to the International Code of Zoological Nomenclature. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a worldwidely accepted convention in zoology that rules the formal naming of organisms treated as animals. It's also informally known as the ICZN or the Code uh, commissioned by the International Commission for Zoological Nomenclature. It regulates the names of animals according to six central principles, which we won't go into. Uh, so those of you who are interested, you know, seeing how we do it, you can have a look at this and uh, check the internet. Uh, in, uh, the scientific names are always based on, uh, on Latin, uh, often with Greek as well, um, but based in Latin. And if we name them after local names that like you have seen me do, we have to Latinize, uh, whether it's names of places, names of people or other names. Now, no one, of course, is born an expert and the journey uh, is long. But as Julius Caesar said, Veni Vesi VC, that means I came, I caught, I saw, I conquered. But in order to do that, you know, the Tigi, Interlego, and Amavi means I touched, I understood, I comprehend, and I love. So really, in order to become uh, you know, a, a, a specialist in the field, you really need to hold, to touch, to understand to study, and then when we do that, we will love what we are doing. And as we love more, as we get involved more, we want to be, we, we love more, and when we love more, we want to be more involved. And it's really is a very um, wonderful cycle which we go into. The more we know, the more we love. And the more we love, the more we know. So we should all get started now. Think of what it is out there that you have an interest in or that somebody doesn't know anything about. And just go out there, look at them, study them, you know, and, and, and a lot of us, I mean, maybe some of you, you know, just go out and take photographs of anything you see. That's good in itself, but it doesn't contribute much to understanding nature. So you can, you know, look at this particular group of animals with a particular field of, of, of study and go deep into it. And that's how you become an expert. Uh, we don't have to be an expert immediately, but as you go through time and you go through effort and you go, uh, go and meet up with people who can give you some lead and Li Kong Chen, uh, Natural History Museum has lots of experts there and I'm sure many of them would be more than willing to be involved uh, and to help you get started or point you in the right direction. So thank you very much for listening. I hope that's of interest uh, to at least some of you. Thank you very much. And we have some time for questions. Thank you. Thank you for your general sharing, Dr. Xiao. So yeah, we do have quite a number of questions. Uh, so I will read it out to you. Uh, let's see. Okay, so uh, CHW is curious on why there are so many photos of the stick insects mating. Is it, are they easier to spot when they mate? Well, I'll tell you, it's much more... Well, it's much more interesting for sting insects to have company. They are not uh, gregarious animals like bees, right? But uh, if you just take a stick insect, it's six legs out there, two antenna out there. So really, there's not very much that they can, they can do. So with a uh, mating sting insects, we can show the male as well as a female. Uh, I think if you talk to people who are out in the forest, they don't often come across um, stick insects mating. You know, it's more often find things like single. 
Um, but when we find a meeting, it's not something of more of interest. We know the life cycle is going on and we can see both males and females. And one of the things about sting insect mating is I have actually, um, um, let me put it this way, um, confirm that the male and female are actually one species. Because oftentimes the male and the female sting insect look so different. Mm. And often when we look at um, sting insects, I, I find that the male may have been described as one species in a one genus in one genus and a female as a different species in another genus. So when we find a meeting, we can say, oh look, they actually are relatives, or in fact, they are not just relatives, they are the, they, they are one, you know, one species. So uh, just to show you, I just wanted to show you also some of them look quite similar, but some of them look quite different. Um, and you, and you can see from the photos I showed earlier. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Adam. What is your advice for people without a scientific background that have a passion for wildlife and would still like to make meaningful contributions to the scientific record or conservation efforts? Yeah, I think, you know, a good thing to do uh, is actually to be involved with a more scientific group. I think if you, if, if you look at our local Facebook groups, you know, a lot of it is just, you know, I, I don't want to demean anybody, but a lot of it is people just, posting rubbish, you know, uh, comments to other people's photographs, you know. Uh, so people are asking, uh, what is this insect? Somebody says, oh, it's a mosquito, it's an overgrown mosquito, <laughs> it's a house fly. Well, obviously it's not, you know. So, but when you get involved um, with a more scientific group, uh, people who are really interested, you know, don't just throw it out to all the laymen. Uh, then, uh, and especially as I said earlier, with people with uh, Lee Kong Chen Natural History Museum, you know, or people in end parks uh, who I have, have, have some interest in this area or get together with some friends who, who say, you know, not, not as we just photographies, I say is good, but a bit deeper than that. And then you start to get information from books, you know, from reliable books, from reliable sites, and then try identify things. Uh, and then you can learn as you go along um, how you can actually develop a way of identifying the subjects you have. And as you concentrate on those few um, species or those few genera, you become an expert in that. You know, you may not be a world expert, but at least a local guy who people go to and say, look, I've got this mosquito, I've got a stick inside, what is it? You know, and oftentimes you may be seeing something new because um, the local expert may not have so much time to go around every day, but there are thousands of people out there walking around every day and somebody can always spot something which uh, they have not seen. So I think the thing is to arm yourself uh, with people around you who have the same interests and then don't sting on books, you know, try and get those uh, good guidebooks and then try and, uh, and then museums are the best place because, not just because I'm an associate research fellow with <laughs> Lee Kong Chen, but really museums are where you go to compare specimens, look at specimens. And if you want to do scientific stuff, you really like describing, uh, writing those 10 books and describing new species, you got to go to the museum where the, what we call a type specimen, the specimen on which the description is based on. You got to go and look at those specimens, compare them to see what you have is what was described or is it something different that looks like it. So people always say, if it looks like a sparrow, you know, if it, flies like a sparrow, if it sings like a sparrow, it's a sparrow. But often when you compare, it's not a sparrow, you know, but you don't compare, it looks like. So that's how I think the scientific approach should be. Yeah, so thank you very much, Adam. Thank you. The next question is from Karen. Uh, she would like to ask, what species of flora do you usually find stick insects? Uh, okay, stick insects um, are very host plant specific, you know? They are like your friends, they only want to eat chicken rice or they only want to eat mee siam or they only want to eat, you know, um, nasi brani, you know, so, uh, and they cannot eat anything else. So they are, they are, a lot of species are very specific to the host plant. You give them different host plant, which amount insect may eat, they just refuse and they just die. Mm -hmm. so, so we don't look at host plant because we look at host plant, we only find those two insects. So for me, when I go to a forest, I look at every single plant because different species feed on different plants. You know, unless you're looking for a particular species, you know, uh, like for example, 
uh, we know that some species, um, well, in Singapore, there are quite a few species that, that people rear in the past and are rearing now that feeds of guava. So, but guava is not grown in a while here, you know, so you, you, you can't look for them anyway. Um, but knowing the host plant, if you are looking for the specific insect, you look at the host plant. But if you are looking for anything, then you got to look at everywhere. And that's why it's so difficult. And most of most people I, I realize they say they've never seen stick insect because things insect are so well camouflaged. Mm -hmm. And and most people walking, they're looking for everything, looking at monkeys, they're looking at wild boar, they're looking at birds. So obviously they're gonna miss the more cryptic things like stick insects, which look more like sticks or leaves. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh are wings found only on the males, or do some females also have wings? Uh, no, different uh sort of groups of stick insects have different morphology. So some stick insects, um, both sexes have wings. Some both sexes don't have wings. But where only one sex have wings is usually the males. So the females don't have wings because really females are the most attractive, right? Even of the human, human race. Like of course, like, you know, uh, Jia Xuan is much more attractive looking than me, you know? Um, so the males, the females can just stay in one place happily, merrily, just eating, you know, and the eggs. The males got to go around and look for them to mate and to, you know, to, to um, have, have babies. So the males have to fly around looking for the females. The females just wait there and advertise and say, I'm here, you know, hiding, come look for me. So whereas, where they don't have, both don't have wings, the males have wings, the females don't have. Otherwise, they both have or they both don't have. Mm. Uh, are there any poisonous or venomous stick insect species? And are these insects being hunted by snakes? So separate questions that I just merged together. Uh, uh, they're hunted by? Snakes. Oh yeah, snakes. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think, no, no. Stick, stick insects uh, by and large eat only uh, leaves. They can take some fruits, you know, uh, just nibbling, nibbling on them. But they are not... Um, venomous they, they they don't bite you or, or sting you they don't have stings they don't have bites some of them have sharp spines as you've seen the photographs so if you catch them you know they can just spite you um now um they some of them do have sprays they spray from their thoracic glands um, which can be quite um sort of irritating to the to the to the nose or to the eyes but they are not in any way dangerous at all yeah, uh, when it's eaten by snakes, well, there are no snakes in Singapore that eat insects. Although I, I, sus I suspect that some of the small baby insect, uh, snakes do eat stick insects. Uh, there are snakes in other places in the world which are known to eat uh, insects. So I guess those will eat um, uh, stick insects. But most snakes are actually, you know, flesh eaters, right? <laughs> other than, you know, insect eaters. Mm. Uh, how do stick insects send signals to their other house when they are ready to move? Well, they don't. They don't have zoom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, as all all insects actually, uh, in fact, a lot of animals, they use uh, pheromones. You know, um, it is something that has not been well studied in stick insects, uh, but certainly I have seen. I have. Uh, I can tell you, uh, there was an experience of mine. I saw a very beautiful looking stick insect and I was, I, it's a female, I saw it and I was taking my, my camera, I was just going to take a photo of it. Suddenly a male flew, <laughs> let out and started meeting. So, you know, uh, obviously, you know, there's some magic, you know, formula they're using, but we know that in all insects, not stick insects particularly, but insects, they go by pheromones. Pheromones, you know, are very um, micro concentrated um, chemicals which they expel um, probably from the from the bottom end uh, which these insects are able to detect in some way. Can you ask whether a female stick insect can continue to breed without a male stick insect? Yeah, that's something we call a parthenogenesis. Parthenogenesis is the ability to produce fertile eggs without the presence of a mate or without the presence of a mating. Now, um, parthenogenesis in uh, stick insects is quite different from parthenogenesis, for example, in ants or in, in, in bees. You know, uh, for, for bees and ants, if there's no mating, 
uh, the babies they produce, you know, are all um, males. Um, you know, but in in thick insects, if there's no mating, the babies they produce are all females, so that they can produce the line. In fact, in Singapore, there are a few species here that no males have ever been found. In fact, there is one particular species in throughout all its range, as far as we are able to ascertain now, and that's because uh, we've now found male, but also because the the females have been reared and the eggs have never produced any male. Uh, mm -hmm. There, there, are, there are some uh, two or three species here in Singapore uh, that are like that. So no males, they're all just females, and they are just reproducing happily. So it's a very um, you know matriarchal society without any males at all. Amazonian, as uh, you should say. But does this create like a population skew whereby there are very rare females and too many females? Uh, say that again. Uh, does this create like a population skew whereby there's too many females and very, very little males? No, no, no. In, in this uh, particular what I call paternogenetic species, there have never been any males. Mm, oh. and, and the females don't care. They're just simply <laughs> reproducing. We mustn't, we mustn't allow that in Singapore. La. <laughs> Okay, so uh, the next question, do you classify species based on morphology only or do you also employ molecular biology techniques? Um, yeah, for myself and uh, as well as for many of the stick insect um, uh, taxonomists, uh, we use a lot of morphology. We haven't had uh, a need to use molecular biology yet, but yes, there are people around the world who use um, molecular genetics to differentiate species. Now, molecular genetics is a very new field. It's used to differentiate a lot of uh, species, what they call cryptic species, in that the species look alike, but they differentiate them based on uh, molecular genetics. Now, this is something I think needs to be better understood and discussed. Uh, we often, or molecular geneticists, often say if a species has a 3% difference um, between them, then it is a different species. But just to let you know, the gorilla and us and the chimpanzee and us has less than 3% difference. So how come we are different species? Of course, some of us look like gorillas and some look like orangutans, but we know we are not, you know, um, the same species. So, you know, there's still a lot to be learned. And I think um, this comes to, you know, the linear uh, understanding of what is a species you know so i think um this this is still a, a lot of discussion going on among taxonomies not just in, for stick insect but also in all fields of uh, zoology uh do female stick insects consume the meals after mating oh you know. <laughs> <laughs> actually human females consume the meals right after they get married <laughs> in a slow fashion <laughs> no, no, just joking. The, 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 as I said, the stick insects are not uh, insectivorous species. They are leaf eaters. So they never consume uh, sort of insect food. So they don't eat other insects. So I think uh, our questioner is probably asking about praying mantises. Mantises are, are insectivorous or even carnivorous. Uh, uh, you know, um, mantis, I've seen them eating small snakes, they've seen them eating small rats, even birds, you know. So small birds, sometimes very big brain mantis can eat this sort of thing. Um, but no, sting sex are, are just phytophagus or leaf eaters. Mm. Okay, the next question is, why do some stick insects uh, have very bright colors? Isn't it harder for them to camouflage? Yeah, you find that a lot of the bright colored ones are actually flyers. That means they have wings, they fly around. Uh, of course, some of them I showed you earlier are not flyers. Um, but when they, we put them on our table, on our chair, they look very colorful. But if you put them in the forest, you'll be surprised how well they camouflage because the forest is not just all brown twigs. The forest has red leaves, bright flowers. So some of them are amongst the bright flowers. If you look at the forest floor in detail, you think, oh, it's all just a mess of, you know, broken twigs and broken leaves. Now. But you realize, if you look carefully, leaves can be red, leaves can be yellow, leaves can be pink, leaves can be brown. Mm. And when it mixed together, the sting just matches. 
this is what we call, um, you know, we are breaking up the, the shape, right? So they are breaking up the shape, they are breaking up the coloration. So these bright colors, a little bit red here, a little bit pink there, a little bit green here, actually breaks up the morphology of the form. Mm. Much better than just having one brown color. So uh, it's almost 10 o'clock, so we will just have one more question. So uh, there's a question on whether it's possible to identify the genders of the newborn means. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, depending on the species, some species, if it's just newly hatched, may be a bit difficult. But suddenly, once they undergo, you know, um, this molting, uh, you know, when they go to second insta, third insta, it's always uh, quite easy to to identify them. I wouldn't say always, but almost always, quite easy to differentiate the sexes. Okay. Okay. So thank you for all the questions. Unfortunately, uh, we aren't able to finish answering all of them. So uh, I just have one more question for Dr. Sa before we wrap up the sessions. Just now you mentioned that there were people who collect um, stick insect droppings to boil Chinese tea, right? For yes. personal purposes. So as a medical professional and also an expert on stick insects, like can you comment on uh, whether they do actually have medicinal value? Well, I'll, I'll tell you, a, a friend of mine, um, you know, um, Dr. Po actually, he did his master's thesis in the University of Manchester. You can find his, um, his, his thesis online. Uh, in fact, I quoted him in my latest book, The Taxonomic Guide to Stick Insects by Nisula Malaysia. Uh, he did his thesis on the stick insect droppings, as well as the chemical constituent of the leaves they feed on. Very interesting study. He found that stick insects uh, did not absorb um, some of the chemicals in the leaf. Like for example, uh, vitamin E, they did not absorb it. And as well as um, um, this folic acid, uh, they, what happened was that they, so this, this in the stick insect dropping is a concentrate of fiber um, because that's what they eat, right? As mm -hmm. well as uh, this vitamin E. It's, uh, I can't exact, remember the exact figure. I think it's more than 100 times more concentrated in the droppings compared to the leaves. So, so if you are short of vitamin E, you know, sexual drive is low, no oh. energy, you may want to get some stings like droppings and drink them. Vitamin e. <laughs> you know, so, so there is, there is, there is a, some um, um, sort of medical or scientific proof uh, that it contains something that may be helpful to people who are deficient in those things. Thank you, that's very interesting. Okay, so uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. Before everyone leaves, uh, we would really greatly appreciate if you could fill in the feedback form for our session. So if there are any burning questions for Dr. Sarah, you can actually email it to uh, my email and then I will probably get Dr. Sarah to answer them and then I will reply it to you. So I will type my email uh, in the chat box. So if there are any questions that are unaddressed, you may uh, email it to me. Uh, I think my colleague has also sent the link to the feedback form in the chat box. So please uh, fill up the feedback form and uh, we will see you next time for our next webinar.